This program is made possible by the giving of the God Called Partners of Renner Ministries. Welcome to today's program. My name is Rick Renner. I've been waiting for the program to get started because today I'm going to take you right into the heart of ancient Ephesus to Philosopher's Square to the magnificent Celsus Library, and to a place that really has significance for us as believers. In Acts chapter 19, the Bible says that Paul taught every day in the school of Tyrannus, and there God worked special miracles by the hands of Paul. Would you like to go to the school of Tyrannus? Well, today I'm going to take you there in this program. It's going to be great. But I want you to have the entire series, which is called Take a Tour with Rick and it's a tour of the ancient city of Ephesus. Maybe you'll never get to go there, so I'm bringing Ephesus to you. This is a 10-part series. It will thrill you. It'll feed your faith, and it will feed your mind. And we're also offering you my book, which is called A Light in Darkness, a marvelous book that is like... Mm, a resource tool to show you what the New Testament church had to deal with as the church was getting established. They became a light in darkness, and so can you. That's God's call on us. But you can order all these things by going online or by giving us a call. But right now, join me as I take you to Philosopher's Square, to the Celsus Library, and to the School of Tyrannus. Let's get started. Stay tuned for a teaching you can trust. A message that will inspire, strengthen, and equip you with vital insights and understanding from the Word of God. Here is Rick. When the Apostle Paul and his team were finished viewing the stadium, they returned to the stadium road to walk back to the center of the city where it's very likely they entered the great theater of Ephesus. When they were finished there, they went to the marble road where they saw the temple of Artemis, which was later renamed the temple or the hall of Nero. And then Paul and Aquila by themselves most likely walked into the central marketplace. And the reason they went without Priscilla is because women were not allowed to publicly shop back in those days. And if a woman was seen in the marketplace, it's likely that she was a prostitute. The market was a place only for male shoppers and male servants who were carrying the goods that their masters had purchased. But then Paul and Aquila would have walked through the south gate onto Philosopher's Square. And the south gate was a monumental gate that looked like a triumphal gate, except it had three arches. The freedmen who built the gate had become fabulously rich as a result of formerly serving as slaves in the imperial household. Later, the two former slaves built the three-arched gate to honor the imperial family and to demonstrate gratitude for their freedom. After its construction was completed in 3 BC, the two freedmen dedicated the gate to the imperial family, to the Emperor Augustus and the Empress Livia, and to their daughter Julia and son-in-law Marcus Agrippa. When Paul, Aquila, and Priscilla saw this spectacular gate, they probably stopped to read the inscriptions that covered its walls. They may have read the following dedication in Latin. It said, this gate was built in honor of its patrons, the Emperor Augustus, son of Caesar, the high priest, 12 times council, 20 times tribune, and Livia, the spouse of Caesar Augustus, and by Mithradates, in honor of his patrons, Marcus Agrippa, the son of Lucius, three times council, emperor, six times tribune, and Julia, the daughter of Augustus Caesar. Those who looked on this gate for the first time marveled at the history represented in its inscriptions and the intricate carvings depicting historical figures and events. As the three looked at this gate, they must have wondered at how magnificent it was. As you can see behind me, this square is still filled with tourists from around the world who still stand and look at this three arched gate with wonder. The interior of the gate had four niches in the interior of the arches. In these niches stood attractive statues of the Emperor Augustus and his imperial family to remind those who walked through the gate in whose honor it had been constructed. 
two tombs set at both ends of the gate for the two slaves who built this magnificent structure. When Paul and Aquila walked through the three arches of the gate of Mazius and Mithridates, they probably met Priscilla right here on the square behind me. This was called Philosopher's Square. Philosopher's Square was the center of learning for the city of Ephesus, and it was also famous throughout all of Asia for its philosophers who were trained in the renowned school of Plato in the city of Athens. Students from the lands surrounding the Aegean Sea traveled to Ephesus to sit at the feet of these learned thinkers. But in the year 110 AD, construction began on the large Celsus Library that eventually occupied Philosopher's Square. The library was finally completed in 117 AD. The world's largest library at that time was located in Alexandria. The second largest library was in Pergamum. The Celsus Library in Ephesus ranked third in size and included space for at least 12,000 volumes. The library's architecture was simply breathtaking. Its tall facade had multiple porticos and rows of elegant columns, and four exquisite statues of women were erected in niches on the front of the building with inscriptions on their bases indicating that they each represented wisdom, understanding, virtue, and science. But in 52 AD, when Paul, Aquila, and Priscilla arrived in Ephesus, the library was not yet built. Philosopher's Square was a meeting place for those who wished to engage in philosophical debate and discussion, including the city's Jewish community. And some scholars really believe an open-air synagogue was located near here before the construction of the Celsus Library. If the open-air synagogue was located here, as many scholars believe, then a very important event occurred right behind me on this square. We read about it in Acts chapter 18, verse 24. The Bible says, And a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the Scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in the Spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, but knowing only the baptism of John, which means he really did not know anything about Jesus yet. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. That would have been in the open-air synagogue in the square right behind me. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. Or they said, hey, Apollos, we need to tell you the rest of the story. It's good that you received John's baptism unto repentance, believing that one day a Messiah would come. But now we need to tell you the rest of the story. The Messiah has come. And as a result of their encounter with Apollos, in the open-air synagogue, probably right behind me, Apollos became a Christian, a mighty Christian leader, and eventually even served as the pastor in the city of Corinth. But just to the side of Philosopher's Square are a set of steps that go up to a platform where some scholars say once was located the school of Tyrannus, which we read about in Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19, verse 8 says, and he, that's the Apostle Paul, went into the synagogue. The synagogue would have been the open-air synagogue, which was located directly behind me. He went into the synagogue and spake boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading things concerning the kingdom of God. Verse 9. But when divers were hardened and believed not, but spake evil of that way before the multitude, he, that's Paul, departed from them and separated the disciples, disputing daily in the school of one Tyrannus. And actually, where I'm sitting right now is the platform that once held the school of Tyrannus. And what is so interesting is that when Paul left the synagogue, he simply walked a few steps away to those ancient steps that walked up to this platform where there was a school that was no longer being used. And Paul occupied that building, and every day he began to teach students right here 
not in the synagogue, but close enough to catch the Jews on their way to the open air synagogue. And they were lured into this place along with Greeks, along with pagans. And the Bible tells us Paul taught them for two years. Listen to this. And this continued by the space of two years so that all they which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. And listen to this. Verse 11, and God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul, verse 12, so that from his body were brought into the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. Think about it. What began as heartache ended in revival. Paul really wanted to reach the Jews in the open air synagogue, but they did not want to hear his message. And after trying to reach them for three months, finally, in a state of being brokenhearted, he left the open air synagogue and simply walked up these steps into the school of Tyrannus and began to teach the Bible every day. And boom, suddenly the power of God exploded until everyone in the city of Ephesus had heard the name of the Lord Jesus. But when Paul and his team first walked to this notable part of the city, he had no idea that he would be teaching classes in the school of Tyrannus. But a day would come when Paul freely taught the Word of God on these very premises. And think about it. Paul's education perfectly equipped him to stand alongside pagan educators, philosophers, and orators as he taught at Tyrannus School. And Acts 19 tells us that the Word of God mightily grew during the months and years that followed the team's arrival in the city. But when Paul, Aquila, and Priscilla first strolled through this part of Ephesus, they didn't yet realize the impact they would have in that school situated just south of Philosopher's Square. Directly across the street from the library in Philosopher's Square was this enormous building, which was mistakenly called the Central Brothel by archeologists for many, many years. Today, we know it was probably originally administrative building for those who administrated the 12,000 scrolls in the library across the street. However, it's very possible that when the city fell into decline and workers came to the ancient site of Ephesus to remove all the materials to take them elsewhere for building in other places, it is possible that this was used as a brothel for the workers. There are some who say, well, there would never be a central brothel right in the very heart of Ephesus. However, if you go to other ancient Greek and Roman cities, you find the brothels really were in the very center of the city. For example, if you go to the city of Pompeii, there is a huge brothel right in the middle of the city. If you go to the city of Corinth, there are brothels all over the place because the entire city of Corinth was dedicated to the goddess Aphrodite, who was the goddess of the streetwalkers or the prostitutes. Many brothels were located in the heart of cities, which indicates how deeply the Greek way of thinking about these matters were entrenched in the population. This building was a huge two-story complex just a few steps away from Philosopher's Square. It had nearly 30 rooms on the first floor and many rooms on the second floor. Beautiful frescoes adorned the walls, the floors were intricately decorated with marvelous mosaics, and there was a fountain that graced the interior decor of the complex. The Roman world and the Greek world had such a lax view about sexuality, and many believers were getting caught up in fornication. So when the Apostle Paul wrote to the Corinthians, he told them in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, there has no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. Then listen to this, that God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. Sometimes people say, oh God, please, please provide for me a way of escape. Well, it's very interesting. In the Greek, when it says a way of escape, it is the Greek word ek basis. Oh, there's the answer. The word ek means out. The word basis means to step. 
When you translate it correctly, it means to step out, which means the same feet that carried you into a bad place are the same feet that can take you out of that place, which means the answer for your escape is your feet. Get moving, hightail it out of that bad place. New Testament believers had been delivered from a very, very dark world, but there were a lot of temptations to lure them back into places they did not need to go to. So Paul's words were very important that they were to use their feet and hightail it out of those places. Wow, Ephesus is filled with tourists today, just like it was in the first century when three brand new tourists arrived in the city. Their names were Paul, Aquila, and Priscilla. And after they saw Philosopher's Square and the School of Tyrannus, they suddenly turned up their famous road called Curita Street, which headed to the east part of the city. And as they walked up that legendary street, they passed the Harun on their right. The Harun was a sacred building where people honored city founders and heroes and a place to worship gods who were not important enough to have an entire temple dedicated to their honor. In this cult building, people paid homage to the past or they offered sacrifices and burnt sacred incense to the gods to help secure for themselves a good future. But as the apostolic team walked past the Harun, Looking right and left on both sides of Curita Street, they must have been again struck by the vast number of pillars, columns, statues, and idols that lined the street. And as they took a few steps further, suddenly their gaze fell on the tomb of Arsinoia, Queen Cleopatra's younger sister. Over many years, Cleopatra was at war with her younger sister because she vied for the Egyptian throne. And during one of those episodes, Cleopatra's sister was taken captive by Julius Caesar, who was an ally of Cleopatra. Arsinoia was forced to march as a captured prisoner during one of Caesar's triumphal marches in Rome, but he later granted her safe sanctuary in Ephesus, which was a haven for Egyptians. The very fact that Caesar chose Ephesus as Arsinoia's place of refuge bears witness to the vast number of Egyptians who lived in Ephesus at that time. But even in Ephesus, Arsinoia was not safe. She took up sanctuary in the temple of Artemis, believing that the priests there would protect her. But finally in 41 BC, Arsinoia was murdered on the steps of the temple at the order of Mark Antony and at the instigation of her sister, who was Queen Cleopatra. Arsinoia's life was so intertwined with Ephesus that after her death, she was buried in this large tomb in the very heart of Ephesus. Everywhere Paul and his team looked in this ancient city, they must have felt surrounded by a deep sense of history. But this was just the beginning of Curita Street. There was so much more for them to see further up the road.
People often call or write to ask, when will Rick take his next tour group to Ephesus? We want to go. So many people have made this request that Rick decided to bring Ephesus to you in the new series, Take a Tour with Rick, Ephesus. After years of praying and planning, Rick finally went to Ephesus to film this personal tour for you. And he gives the entire tour through the eyes of the Apostle Paul and Aquila and Priscilla as they saw Ephesus when they first arrived there to start the church at Ephesus. With permission from local authorities, even off-limit sites were open to Rick so he could take his film crew to show you sites that even tourists are not able to see. This is truly a one-of-a-kind tour, but it's not just a tour. As Rick walks you through the paths of Ephesus, he teaches all along the way. This 10-part documentary-type visual series is available in digital or physical formats, starting at just $20. We're also offering you the book, A Light in Darkness. This beautiful 800-page book features on-location photography with added artwork and illustrations to enhance the in-depth scriptural teaching that makes the early New Testament come alive on every page. Rick reveals insights into the ancient world and the disturbing realities that early believers faced as the church began to flourish in a pagan world. This book is available right now for just $80. Don't miss this special offer. The visual series, Take a Tour with Rick, Ephesus, and the book, A Light in Darkness. Call the number on your screen or go to renner.org to order. Call or go online now. Hey friends, this is Rick Renner, and today I want to give you a report about what's happening in the construction of our new studio. Work still continues. It's taken a little bit longer than we anticipated because of all the sanctions that have stopped materials from coming to Russia, but we're doing it step by step. And today they're installing the fireplace, which is going to be the centerpiece of this big room where we're going to be filming programs. But in addition to this, there's gonna be another set over here and another set over there. So many angles and opportunities to film teaching that people can trust in this room. But of course, this is just one room. But I have to tell you, I'm pretty excited about this room. To think that TV programs with the Word of God are going to be filmed right here. And when I look around this room, you can see this electrical grid, grid that's gonna hold all the lights. It's on electrical pulleys, so it goes up, it goes down. It's just going to have everything we need to film the teaching of the Word of God. But hey, there's more than this. Let me show you. Well, I know you can't tell from what it looks like right now, but this really is gonna be one of the smaller studios, and this is gonna be Denise's studio because Denise is reaching women everywhere with her programming. And right from this spot, Denise is going to be sending her teaching to women all over the world. But hey, there's another set in addition to this one. This is our third studio in this new building. You may say, why do you need three studios? Because we're filming a lot of programs. Right now, we can only film one program at a time. We have to set it up, take it down, but this will enable us to do multiple things at one time. But on both floors of this building, there are multiple offices. In fact, there are 18 offices, and in all of these offices, people are going to be doing editing, writing, producing programs, working with our network. It is amazing the activity that's going to take place in this building. And it's not about buildings, it's about people. People need the teaching of the Word of God. But it's your generous gifts that have helped us to build this and we will complete it. But right now we're in phase three of our ministry, which is paying off our Tulsa ministry headquarters. We wanna pay it off because the moment it's paid off, all of those funds will be released for us to broadcast the teaching of the Word of God around the world. And that's really our goal, to get the gospel and to teach people the Bible all over the world. They're just crying out for it and they're waiting for that signal to come with the answer that they've been seeking. So please help us as we finish phase three to pay off the Tulsa facility. Well, how did you enjoy today's program? I took you to Philosopher Square, to the Celsus Library, and to the very spot called the School of Tyrannus, where God works special miracles by the hands of the Apostle Paul. 
Many people wanted to go to Ephesus with me, and I can't give everyone a personal tour. So I decided to bring Ephesus to you. But I want you to order the entire series, which is called Take a Tour with Rick, Ephesus. And I take you right into the ancient city of Ephesus to every single part of it. It is fully documented because I want you to see it like Paul, Aquila, and Priscilla saw it when they first arrived in Ephesus in the year 52 AD. And we're also offering you my book, which is called A Light in Darkness. This is an amazing book. And if you don't have a copy of A Light in Darkness, I really want you to have a copy. It's so many pages of revelation, history, and information. It will feed your spirit. It will feed your mind. And it will cause the New Testament to really come alive for you. So please order your copy of A Light in Darkness today. But you can order all these things by going online right now or by giving us a call. And when you reach out to us, always let us know how to pray for you because we are people of prayer and we believe the power of God will meet you right where you are. But I want to pray for you right now. Father, we thank you that you've anointed us. You've chosen us for the season that we live in, and we really can be a light in darkness. We embrace the anointing. We embrace the power of God, and we thank you for helping us to be a light in darkness. In Jesus' name, amen. When we come back in the next program, I'm going to take you up the street into the next section of Ephesus. It's going to be good. Don't miss it. But until then, remember Ecclesiastes 8.4, it says, where the word of a king is, there's power. Renner Ministries is proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ through every available media to the uttermost parts of the earth. Discover the many ways you can help us make a difference in lives around the world with the Word of God. We invite you to partner with us in teaching, strengthening, and rescuing lives for the glory of God. Together, we can make a difference that will last throughout eternity. This program was made possible by the giving of the God-called partners of Renner Ministries.